And they switch shots, so don't worry. Oh. everyone and we're back here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge. This is Kate Warnock coming to you live from the AHIP Institute and Expo. Delighted to have our next guest, Dr. Kebe Savave. Welcome to the interview. Hi Kate, good to be here. So Dr. Savave, your title is the Senior Managing, Managing Director of the Health Industry for Accenture. Yes. So welcome and I know that you have a talk coming up tomorrow. My first question for you is kind of about that talk. You know, the, prom the premise of your talk is technology for people. Explain the paradigm shift and how it plays out in the five trends that you're watching. Mm -hmm. uh, we look at technology and business and the intersection every year, and we look at it across all industries. And then my job is to bring that to healthcare. And we've been looking at the evolution of the intersection of business and technology, especially with all these digital technologies mm -hmm. that are coming forward. This year we're particularly highlighting the fact that the real future is technology working with people and for people as opposed to this idea that it's technology versus people or technology having people having to meet technology on its terms. And so, for example, uh, one of the concepts we talk about is how artificial intelligence is going to be the next user interface. We, the shorthand is AI right. is the next UI. And what right. that really means is that in the old way of interacting with technology, it was you know, organized basically for you to look up information if you needed it or uh, to interact with it um, in a relatively uh, structured, static way. But now that things like artificial intelligence exist, the ability to understand and anticipate what you need when you interact with technology, the actual interaction itself is smart. Right. And that can be as simple as the ability to speak to the computer as opposed to type in. That speech and voice is actually powered by artificial intelligence and we're seeing more and more that people would rather interact through voice than through right. typing. Uh, but it also shows up in some very specific healthcare applications. There, uh, one of the applications that we highlight in our report is by a company called HealthTap and they focus historically on allowing patients who might have a medical question uh, would usually navigate a series of choices. They might uh, go online and look up some material in a reference or they might want to have an email exchange with a doctor uh, that might feel like a chat or they might want to have a voice call or a video call. Well over the years they have amassed a database of interactions that were essentially chat-based between patients and doctors. They've taken that information and they have trained the uh, essentially the user interface so that now when you begin the journey the, the technology itself will ask you a set of questions to help refine the nature of your question and right. maybe give you some parameters about whether this is a serious condition or whether you should talk to someone right away or whether you should wait and talk to your doctor helps you make those decisions and it's a much smarter way of interacting. It is essentially the benefit of having stored all of these conversations and using them to learn and it learns all the time. So now the actual user interface is really designed to deal with you the way you would normally talk to a person. So it seems incredible to me that, that technology has really taken this great leap forward. Um, you know, is this going to be accessible to everybody, in your opinion, mm -hmm. or is this going to be limited to just the folks who can afford it? No, actually not at all. In fact, uh, one of the real powers of information technology in healthcare in particular is that it, al it allows care to be much more uh, inexpensive in many ways okay. because it uh, gives us it, for example you don't have to have you don't have to have a relationship or a conversation in person with a with a doctor or a nurse you can have an interaction that could be separated in distance or in time well that actually brings the cost of care down because the the most expensive resource is that individual's time and if I'm a doctor sure. and I can serve many people at once or maybe armed with artificial intelligence I can serve a larger group of people than I would by myself mm -hmm. to an individual the cost of that care just became cheaper right. we actually think that technology leads to productivity and productivity leads to a more affordable healthcare system Outstanding. Well, it sounds like a, you know we're really on the right path Absolutely. then, aren't we? Well, in doing some research on you, Dr. Safavi, um, I, I saw that two years ago you stated that people rank the following in order of importance when asked 
who was in charge of your health? First was me, then was my community, mm -hmm. then my government, mm -hmm. then my doctor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, do you think that the industry would be surprised mm -hmm. by that order? Um, Probably less now than they were a couple of years ago. I was actually looking, using uh, uh, some work that uh, the firm Edelman had done mm -hmm. on a global health study looking at citizen attitudes toward health. And the question they asked was really who's responsible for your health. It's interesting to healthcare organizations because they think that health means health care. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this original work was to demonstrate that a citizen's view of health is much more comprehensive than just a medical condition treated by a doctor. Right. Now, since that time, there's been a lot more awareness and discussion by healthcare providers of concepts like social determinants of healthcare. Well, that's code for things that have nothing to do with what a doctor or a hospital can do have an effect on my health status. So in general, I think the healthcare delivery system, the medical system, is becoming more and more aware of the fact that things that have nothing to do with medicines have an effect on health care. Uh, the other part of this is really the concept of accountability and responsibility. And our society continues to uh, really emphasize the notion that we're ultimately responsible for ourselves, right? We talk about things like how diet and exercise matter toward your illness. Sure. So I'd say overall, there's a much greater awareness that when it comes to health, the first stop is ourselves and our community. And really, it's for our illnesses that we go to the medical system. Right, right. It really is so much more than just that discreet visit to the doctor's office, mm -hmm. isn't it? Absolutely. All right, well, another, another thing that I was able to find uh, from, from your background, Dr. Zavavi, you recently wrote about physicians' potential conflict of interest between patients and payments. Mm -hmm. Can you recap the three suggestions that you made to solve for that conflict? The, uh, the, purpose, the purpose of that article was really to recognize the fact that we have a real dynamic tension going on in uh, our strategies for trying to health care more affordable. In the, 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 the traditional model, which is you go to see a doctor and the doctor gets paid for the work that they do, uh, suggests the fact that the doctor's primary obligation to you is really to you. In the new model, there's this idea that if the doctors were responsible for the totality of your health care costs over time and maybe your outcomes that they might think about things differently and the idea being that it makes healthcare more affordable over time mm -hmm. for society uh, it turns out that there is no specific settled legal framework for whether a doctor's primary responsibility is to you as an individual or to society and that's why all these payment models exist uh, I think that the the most simplest first step here is ultimately one that is about transparency and disclosure. Actually, I would start with awareness. So an awareness from the physician's perspective that you're really balancing two interests, patient's interests and really the interests of society coming through the payment models. Mm -hmm. And from a patient perspective, there may not be a simple answer of A or B, but if you give patients the ability to understand that to some extent the payment models and how you might be compensated. There is, some, there is some trust that gets engendered. The fear doctors have always had, though, is, of course, if, if I tell the patient, look, I'm, I'm paid to take care of you over time, not just for what you do today, and so uh, that some patients may say, well, that, what that really means is you're trying to save somebody money, an insurance company or something else like that. Uh, on the other hand, they might say, well, uh, actually, in the old days, you were just trying to make money, and now you're actually thinking about it differently. So you might see it cut both ways, right? Right. right. So there's no right answer. And, and I really think it's about the relationship, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, that you are absolutely. looking for, for it to be a longer-term sort of, right. of relationship, which is the right kind of dynamic to have. <laughs> right. And the way I yeah. think about it is trust is the central issue, right. and transparency is an input to trust. Right. And right. so... The, these unspoken assumptions, if they come back to a patient who didn't realize it, that undermines trust. If they know in advance, that might advance the cause of trust. Understood. Okay. All right. Well, our next question for you, which is fascinating. Um, <laughs> all right. So another one that I want to I kind of get your perspective on is blockchain. Okay. Um, 
what's your opinion of blockchain's use case in healthcare and what will really help this te technology gain traction? Mm -hmm. I think we're hearing a lot, a lot on the periphery, uh, but there's not really a lot of, mm -hmm. of meaningful, I mean, even here at AHIP, there's right. not necessarily a whole track just devoted to it. So what's your opinion on it? Well, certainly blockchain is one of the new emerging technologies that uh, has lots of promise in many industries. It's also relatively poorly understood. Mm -hmm. uh, and its primary use case right now, obviously, is in financial transactions. So people think about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. Right. Uh, but there are certain attributes of blockchain, like its ability to uh, maintain a chain of uh, ownership or provenance, so you actually know who did what, and it's always there's an integrity to it, uh, and the fact that the way blockchain, which is a distributed ledger, it's really more of a math. Uh, model is executed through technology is very uh, secure in the way it's encrypted has certain benefits so right now the healthcare use cases are really in discovery mode it's much more advanced in its commercial use in financial services right. uh, there is a uh, organizations getting together to try to figure out what the standards would be um, the we are involved right now in I would say research and development efforts thinking about using blockchain around payments right so uh, keeping track of the payments be uh, and uh, uh, payer contribution and patient contribution and handing the information to different parties. There is some thought that it might be useful for the transmission of medical records or at least identity associated with medical records. So there's some R&D around that. Uh, I think it's still pretty much in its early days in terms of knowing what the use case is going to be. Uh, it will have a meaningful effect on healthcare, but it's not clear exactly how fast and what domains it will come out first. Interesting. Okay, so fintech obviously well ahead in, yes. in the use case, but maybe because it's it's a more straightforward sort of line of sight for that kind of technology. And when you're talking about uh, financial transactions and money, actually the range of variables in the data are smaller. Right. Right, absolutely. Well, Dr. Safavi, it was so wonderful having you here and hearing about the trends that you're keeping Thank an you. eye on. And best of luck with your presentation. Right. I know that you'll have a, a you. really interested audience. So, again, thanks for joining us here at the Guidewell My Insights pleasure. Lounge. Thanks Thank so much. You. My name's Kate Warnock. Keep watching. We'll be up soon with another interview.